right, so as we've been saying, we're just going to dig right into this. We've got a bunch to cover. Uh, but as we've been saying over the last several weeks, words are powerful. Words are important. And we even said that words create worlds. And we know that the words that we speak, I kind of said it like this, your words create your world around, basically saying the same thing over and over and over every week. Because if you don't buy into the power of words, you're going to lack the motivation to change. You're, you're going to lack a reason why you should be different, and you're going to, if, if you don't buy into this, you'll be like, ah, oh, you know, it, it's no big deal. It doesn't really hurt anybody, and the people around you are going, uh, yes, yes, it does. So, my title for today is Taming the Tongue, Heart Transplant. We're going to hopefully do a heart transplant within all of us today. So our key statement that we've been saying all along throughout this series is, and again, the, our key statement is the one thing to remember. If you forget everything else, if you, if you nap the entire time, usually I open with the key statement and I close with the key statement, so you're pretty good if you want to take a little snooze in there. I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but I'm not going to call you out, okay? So... Key statement, tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Whatever you say is important in your life, whatever I can look at your checkbook and tell you what's important to you, whatever you spend your time doing, those are the things that are important to you. You had better tame your tongue or you're going to inhibit. You're going to slow down, stop, hurt, damage you will inhibit what's important to you. So our key verse for this series is actually a verse from Luke. You don't have to turn there. We've been just saying it every week. It's Luke 6.45. And Jesus is speaking here, and he, he really, really gets down to it. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, and then he really just lays it on, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so many times we want to argue and we want to say, no, 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 that just slipped out. I didn't mean to say that. And with this verse right here, Jesus is saying, whatever came out of your mouth is in your heart. There's no way around it. Kind of pointed, huh? Because we want to excuse it away with, oh, that was just an accident. I didn't really mean that. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, hopefully you're in James chapter 3, he really hammers down this principle and tells us the importance of our tongue. So let's read through from verse 1 through 7 here. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, or means complete, not perfect like sinless, is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. <clears throat> it's pretty clear there, the point that James is trying to make there in the first section. So we said we had four warnings about the tongue. Now, if you haven't been here, I will give them to you here real fast. Number one, the tongue demonstrates power. 
uh, basically as much, if not more, power than the rest of the body to turn the direction of us. The tongue it demonstrates this power. Number two, the tongue determines direction. And it, it steers in, in our, our lives in the direction, like a horse's bit that's in its mouth or like a ship's rudder. Number three, the tongue delivers destruction. And your tongue is like a fire that can just burn down and wreck anything that it touches. And number four, the tongue doesn't tame definitively. Basically, our tongues are a restless evil that will never be tamed. They're never, never be fully under control. So that's kind of a, 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 a bleak prognosis, isn't it? That's, that's not really good. James is saying, hey, your tongue can and will get you into a lot of trouble, and by the way, you can't actually really fix it. Thanks a lot, James. You know, really super encouraging there, right? Well, so then he moves on, and here's where the passage gets interesting. It, it looks like he completely changes gears, and again, I, I want to I teach us this as we're, as we're reading Scripture I don't want us to always read through something and say, well, he's not saying necessarily the tongue anymore or even in the next section and he's gone to something else. It, it looks like he's kind of shifting a little bit, but he's not. I want to let you in on a little secret. It was never really about the tongue anyway. Now, you're like, wait a minute. Okay, we've spent like several weeks already talking about our tongues and now you're saying... It's not really about our tongue. It's exactly what I'm saying. What is it about? We, we've said it several times. It's about the, our hearts. It really is about our hearts. <clears throat> Verse 9. He makes, <clears throat> he makes this turn. <clears throat> Hold on. You guys good? Did you take it? Hopefully you got a drink in that time too. <clears throat> I did. All right. So in verses 9 through 12, he makes this turn and he makes an appeal from the heart and about the heart. So now he's kind of going in that direction. Verse 9, it says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should 2.7 seconds after we say that. We grab control back and we take it back into ourselves. So you're either going to be spirit-led or self-led. You can't be both. But do you know the problem with being self-led? What is in self-led? I'll give you a hint. It's in the word self-led. What's, what's in there? What's wrong with that? Self. It's us. We're bringing ourselves into the equation. Hold your places in James chapter 3. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 17. It's right after Isaiah, which is a really, really big book in the Old Testament. I was listening. I have this daily devotion that I listen to on the uh, uh, Bible app. And I, I, as I was listening to this chapter, I was like, wow, that really goes along with what we've been saying. I think uh, Jeremiah, and actually really God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, is really hitting the nail on the head here. So listen to this. It's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Jeremiah is speaking, but again, he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Now, we got a problem right there already, right? Because who is self? Man. It's us. So if we're trusting in us, if we're being led by us, we got a problem. What was the very first word that he said the Lord said? Cursed. You're in trouble. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. Now he makes this turn. But, remember, as you're reading, always look for these conjunctions. It means that everything is going to shift 
in this passage. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Who is, another way to say it, who is being led by the Lord. Verse 8 might sound familiar to another verse that we know. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now pause just for a second. Yes, we're talking about a tree. But guess what? We're not really talking about a tree, are we? Insert yourself into that verse as you are the tree. Wouldn't it be nice to be a tree planted by the water, sends out its roots by the stream, meaning you have this strength coming in, this water source, you are being filled. It goes on, it does not fear when heat comes, when the heat of life, when the troubles of life come at you, and guess what they're going to? Just because you believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, yes I do, I love Jesus, how about you, and all of that, that stuff is great, but just because of that doesn't mean no bad stuff comes into our lives. So when that stuff comes into our lives, wouldn't it be nice to not fear? Yes, we have to address it. Yes, we have to work hard at it. Yes, there's going to be seasons. Yes, there are things that are going to be sad. God gave us emotions. But wouldn't it be nice to not fear? It goes on. It says, its leaves are always green, meaning there's always life. There's always vitality in us. It has no worries in a few days of drought, like, like sometimes when we go to pray, like we pray for something and it's like 12 minutes and we're like, God, you didn't answer my prayer request yet. Come on, God, I need you to come through on this. This right here says it has no worries in a year of drought. That is a long time to go without water, isn't it? Humans couldn't do it. Most trees can't do it. But this verse says we can be filled in such a way that, hey, guess what? God can sustain you through that whole year of drought. And it says it never fails to bear fruit. There is always goodness coming out of us. Wouldn't that be awesome to be that tree? Then it kind of changes gears here in verse 9. Watch, he says, the heart, wait a minute, what? What in the world? Why are we talking about the heart? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Why is that the next verse? That's really interesting. Except he kind of circles back around and explains it. Verse 10, he says, I, the Lord, search the heart And examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. God's saying, hey, listen, I'm searching your hearts. I want to know what's really inside of there. And if it's self, if it's not me, then guess what? Your roots never made it to the water source. That source of life, your roots are never going to make it there. Stay rooted and grounded in me. By the way, don't listen to your heart. I know the song says it. Listen to your heart. I, yeah, yeah, no, don't do that. This verse right here, that's a lie. This verse says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It's pretty scary. That's why we need a heart transplant. That's why we need to do something different. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. When we have a problem with the things that come out of our mouths, what do we normally just try to do? Stop saying those things, right? I'm going to stop saying that. I'm going to stop doing that. It's a temporary fix. The problem is in our hearts, and the problem is because there's too much self in our hearts. Now, 
if you battle with negative things that come out of your mouth, and I'm pretty sure that we said the very first week we either all raised our hands or we lied in church and we, we all said, hey, we all have a problem with our mouths, with our tongues, with the things that we say, with, with the hurt and the destruction that comes out of our mouth. So if you battle with those things, James hits the nail on the head in verse 13. Verse 13 says, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, that, that's not in the sense of like, I'm wise, I'm going to spit some knowledge at you, I'm so smart. That's not that kind of wisdom that he's talking about. It's more like wise and knowledgeable, and actually if you look at this word, it's wise and knowledgeable because of prior experience or personal relationship. That's this kind of wisdom, like, like in dealing with relationships, dealing with people, prior experience. You're wise because maybe you've done it wrong before and you said, ah, I never want to do that again. So it says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Now, that word humility, it means meekness and gentleness, but one of the really great definitions or way to understand uh, humility. One of my favorite ones is power with reserve and gentleness. And I think that's exactly what this passage is saying by the humility that comes from wisdom. Like, like we have power, we have uh, something to say. We have, what, what is that called when we want to say something about something? And we have lots of them all the time. It starts with an O. Opinion. We have lots of those, don't we? There's some sayings about opinions. We don't say them in church. But power with reserve and gentleness. That's the humility that he's talking about. We might have something to say, but humility is that power to not say it, to hold back. Why? Oh, because we've been there before. Because we've said those things before, and it didn't work out real well. And I don't really like sleeping on the couch, and I like a relationship with this, and I really did like that job, but mm, I don't work there anymore now because I did that. And looking back at that, wisdom is understanding where that got you before. Now, if you have, here's a question, if you have true wisdom and understanding in the context of this passage, how do you show humility or meekness? I just said it. You keep your mouth shut. Two ears, one mouth. Quick to listen. Be so careful about opening our mouths. Now, verse 13 is kind of the positive way to say it, right? Let, 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 them, let them show that you've got understanding by their good life, by your good deeds and humility. And yeah, it comes from wisdom and all that. That's a really nice way to say it. And then James goes in like, I mean, we've been talking about the one-two punch. I mean, here he comes. It's like, all right, gloves are off. Elbows are going to be thrown here. Verse 14. But, there's that word again. But if you harbor, what's that? Bitter envy, not just regular envy, that's not good enough. We, we're talking about bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Now we want to say, James, bro, where did that come from? What, we're, we're just talking about some words that come out of our mouth. And yes, I know they do damage sometimes and all that. But James, why do you have to say bitter envy and selfish ambition. Why did you have to go that far with this? Well, to tie this, this last section to uh, the previous two sections, I want to review some of the issues that we have with our mouths. And, and see, here's, here's the thing. The things that come out of our mouths are more like symptoms of a real issue that's inside. Like, like you know, like, like if you have the flu, 
What, what, are, what happens to you when you have the flu? What are some of the symptoms? What? Body ache, cough, fever, right? You got the, 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 flan, the runny nose and, the <laughs> and all of that going on, and you're like, yeah, yeah, all of that stuff. I just want to make sure everybody was awake, okay? But is that really the problem? I mean, those are the things we feel and that we see. But is that really, when you dig down deep, is that what the flu is or are those the symptoms? Those are the symptoms. What's really going on inside of your body? You have a virus. You have an infection. There's something going on that we can't really see. We can't put our finger on it. It's, it's, it's inside of us and our white blood cells are trying to fight things and all of this stuff is happening inside of our body and we see these things that are happening on the outside. See, it's the exact same thing where the hearts. We've got harsh or hurtful words or language. We've got dispensing of uh, just information at any given time or opportunity. Like, like, we know those people, right? Like, they always have something to add. Like, like you could be talking about whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they've got a story. And, and, and sometimes we do it. It's like, we can't wait to tell our story. It's like, dude, shut up and stop telling your story so I can tell my story because my story is way better than yours. Guilty. Just being honest. All right, so we got those people. We got the one-uppers that we talked about, Right? And last week, I'm sorry, I picked on people with, with Kias. Sorry, I just, I said Kia. Okay, so today it's a Honda. I drive a Honda. I drive like a 2006 Honda CRV. It's not great, but it's a great vehicle. I keep waiting for God to like drop a Toyota Tacoma or a 4Runner in my driveway. It hasn't happened yet. So I guess it's not supposed to, yeah, you too. I know, all of us are, right? Let's, let's all just pray for Toyota Tacomas this week. Okay, all right. I, got the, I mean, it just came out. It's a 2024, and it drives us jealousy. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. So, what exactly do those things mean? Bitter envy or selfish ambition? Well, bitter envy is this jealousy. It's, it's I want what you have. And by the way, if I get that, I don't want you to have what you have because if you have it and I have it, that's not good enough. So I don't want you to have it and I just want to have it because if only I have it, that's better for me, right? That's jealousy. That's like, man, I, I, I want this and I will be better if I'm the only one that has it. It's just one example, but we do that. So that's bitter envy. Now this Selfish ambition. This is an interesting word when you look at it. It is erythia. Erythia, sorry. Erythia is the original word. And as I, I, I love being such a Bible nerd and digging into this stuff. Here's what it means. That word means mercenary, self-seeking, or acting for one's own gain regardless of the discord or strife it causes places self-interest ahead of what the Lord declares right or what is good for others. Now, there was one particular word in there that really struck me as I was studying this week. Mercenary. Selfish ambition means a mercenary. What is a mercenary? A mercenary is basically a gun for hire, right? No matter what the cause... No matter what the damage, no matter right or wrong nothing, my allegiance is going to go to the highest bidder. Why? Because I'm all about one thing, moving myself forward, advancing myself. And James is saying, when you have this bitter envy and selfish ambition, you are a mercenary for yourself. No matter what damage you do, it doesn't matter. No matter what the cause, you're all about you. And it doesn't matter what you mow over in the way to get there. And James is saying, that's what's in our hearts that makes all of those things come out of our mouth. 
he clearly makes this connection between our negative tongues. So he's saying that wisdom that comes out of your mouth, it's awful. It's not, it's earthly. It's demonic, unspiritual. It's unwholesome. It's damaging. <clears throat> Verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So what he's doing is he's continuing this thought that he had back in verse 6. Remember in verse 6, if disorder and every evil practice. Now, that's a really big statement because let me read to you what this word disorder actually means. Here we go. Disturbance, upheaval, revolution, almost anarchy, unsettled, unstable, instability, cannot stand, commotion, confusion, things being out of control or up for grabs, and uncertainty. Now, do any of those in that list ever describe your life? I would say probably at a time or another, a few of those kind of register, right? And James is saying, when you cannot get control of your tongue because of your heart, where is that coming from? Because you have those things, that bitter envy, selfish ambition, that's where you're going to find disorder and every evil practice. You think James thinks that what comes out of our mouths and the condition of our hearts is pretty much at the utmost importance? I think so. I think he just keeps hammering it down. Who can tell me without turning there what 1 Peter 5, 8 says? Bible trivia. Anybody just go ahead. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, who? The devil. Your enemy, the person who's looking to kill, steal, and destroy all of the time. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, what do you think exactly he's looking for? Now, you could take this in a couple directions. Oftentimes, when situational awareness, right? See, I got experts in the room. Situational awareness is knowing what's around you knowing that there could be a threat and understanding how you're carrying yourself. For instance, a video that I just saw this week, actually. You're, you're walking, you're alone, you're kind of in a wooded area. It kind of showed this park. You have both headphones in, so you're listening to music. You can't hear anything around. You're looking down. Maybe you're looking at your phone, and you're walking like this. Are you being very situationally aware? No. What are you? An easy target. That's exactly what somebody, a thief or somebody that wants to do really bad stuff, that's exactly what they're looking for. And I think our principle is here is Peter is saying, be alert. Be of sober mind. Know your surroundings. Know what the condition of your heart is. Because if the enemy is going to find somebody that's weak and, and, and an easy prey, guess what? It's going to be a person that has disorder in every area of their life. Going back to James, James says, when we have this bitter envy and selfish ambition in our hearts, we're going to find disorder. And we are going to be an easy target for the enemy. You're either spirit-led or you're self-led. But you can't be both. You can't be both. I wrote this down. God takes chaos and turns it into peace. But the enemy wants to take peace or even chaos and just turn it into more chaos. That's what the enemy's out to do. Kill, steal, and destroy. So the underlying illness that we have, Jesus says in Luke 6 again, is the diseased condition of our heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So we've got two more verses here. 
I don't want everybody to think that James is just this Debbie Downer or he's always just uh, doom and gloom. So he comes back, and here's our word again, verse 17. But, again, he's going to change things. But the wisdom, now notice what's not around that wisdom. No air quotes this time, right? But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Man, what a, what a great list. James is saying true wisdom, real wisdom, wisdom that doesn't need the air quotes, is full of these things right here. It's basically a laundry list of things that should come out of our mouths. Edifying words. Words that build up. Or no words at all. Patience. Loving. Kindness. Those are the things that true wisdom is full of. And then verse 18 peacemakers, which is interesting that he just uses that word, but people who make peace, because obviously if you're using your words and your tongues wrongly, you're not making peace, are you? You're making the opposite. You're making strife. So he says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. If you, like, like, okay, so we don't do a whole lot of planting, right? But sowing, casting seeds, planting things, if you're planting strife and bitterness and anger, guess what you are going to reap? Guess what you're going to get in return? Live in heavenly wisdom. That's the offer on the table. Again, I've taken several weeks to say the same thing over and over and over, that your tongue will get you in a lot of trouble, that, oh, by the way, guess what? It's not your tongue, it's your heart. No, it's not just an accident, it slipped. Nope, bitter envy, selfish ambition, down in there. What are you going to do about it? Because you can't think your way out of this one. You can't hope your way out of this one. You can't try to filter your way out of this one. And oh, I'm not going to say those things anymore. That doesn't work. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to do a heart transplant in you? Remove self and add in the spirit. That's the only way that you can fix this. So our key statement, one last time and we're done. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you make this clear. And I'm sorry, Lord, that we so often mess this up. We're so easy to let words and attitudes and anger and all of that junk fly. But God, I'm so grateful that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord, that no matter how much damage we do, we know that you are still there. So God, I know that there are some in here right now that have damaged relationships because of things that they have said and things that they have done. God, I pray for restoration in those relationships. God, I pray for humility in our hearts that we can honestly and legitimately say, I'm sorry. I am sorry for the things that I have said. That we can approach our friends and our family members and our kids and our spouses, our coworkers, and honestly and humbly apologize for the things that we have said. And God, as, as we know sometimes, Lord, sometimes those words are at you. So God, forgive us for the words that we have to use sometimes for 
not answering our prayer requests quick enough or for allowing things to happen or just we blame you for the fact that we live in a broken, fallen world. God, I confess those things to you. God, would we be humble enough to know that we can't fix this, that it's you and only you by allowing your spirit to come in us and do a heart transplant. That's the only way that we will fix this, Lord. So help us with that. And Lord, I pray for those in this room this morning or attending online. God, if they have never given their heart to you, if they have never established a relationship with you, God, maybe some and rose again three days later. And I trust that that is the only thing that can take away my sin. So God, save me. Change me. I give you my life. you said that this morning for the first time heads are still bowed eyes are closed I would love to know about it I'm not going to call you out or say anything but I just love to pray for you would you just slip your hand up and say I said that today for the first time I started a relationship with Jesus thank you Jesus again we give all to you thank you that you were the perfect sacrifice for our sin. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, would you do something amazing? Help us to be generous people, not just in this church, but in this community, God. Help us to equip people in this community. Help us to love people in whatever way that we can in this community and God in this world. God, help us to be able to support our missionaries give them the resources that they need to further your kingdom in an amazing way. Thank you for all of our missionaries. Thank you for the different missions that we support, God. I just pray that you would bless them, resource them, God. And God, thank you for our freedom. Thank you for our independence in this amazing and great nation. God, we pray for our leaders, all of our leaders, Lord. God, would they all turn their hearts to you God, we don't need party, we don't need politics, we need a savior. So God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you. We pray all of this in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen.